Morning everyone, Milton here with today's Saturday devotional. Um, I want to say thank you all for joining and I look forward to hearing from your feedback on your comments. Uh, but today's devotional comes from, from a, a conversation I had with God a couple of weeks ago while I was, while I was in prayer. The scripture came to mind that is found in Psalms 145. And the part that highlighted the most in my mind when I was praying was the part that says, talk of thy power unto the children of men. So uh, as I was writing down the inspiration that was coming, uh, the Lord asked me to start doing some research on the power of God. And so it's taken me a little while to get to it. And I apologize for that because I should have done it a lot sooner. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, I'm, in, I'm in it now. <laughs> and so um, the question now is here is how much do you and I know about God's power? Not just saying the word power or giving a couple uh, examples, but what does the word power actually mean? And that's what we're going to be learning today by the grace of God. So. In Psalms 145, 8 through 13, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men, his mighty acts and his glorious majesty in his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. So that's one of Psalms 145, 8 through 13. Like I said, the, the part that really stood out to me was, and talk of thy power. Why? And the reason why is right in the following verse right after it says, To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. So today, I guess we're going to be talking about to hear and to respond to what we are being taught or what we're hearing. So the word power, right? Let's start with the word power. The word power in the Hebrew back in the Old Testament, the word power is pala. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right. It's pala. And it, it's, it's the word for miracle, actually. The word miracle, I apologize. The word miracle is the word pala. And it means something marvelous, wonderful, surpassing, and extraordinary that is beyond one's own power to perform. So this is something that we cannot do on our own ability or our own power. Because a miracle is something that only God can do. Let me say that again. A miracle is something that only God can do. I can't perform miracles. You can't perform miracles by the power of your own will, by the laying on of hands, by your own holiness and righteousness. Like the apostle said when he said to the man that they healed the sick. And said, it's not by my own holiness or righteousness that this man is made whole. But it became a testimony or a platform that they might be able to express the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by whose power they were able to heal the sick. Let it be known that by the name of Jesus that this man stands today. Who once was lame, who once was paralyzed, is now standing here dancing and praising before God and all of everyone else in the gate. So the other word, the Old, uh, the, the old Testament word for miracle is also Muppet. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. And that word for miracle means a wonder as a special display of God's power and a sign or a token for a future event. Once again, it means a wonder as a special display of God's power. That's what a miracle is. It's a display of God's power. And in the New Testament, there are two different words. There's, there's, I'm sorry. There, yeah, there are two different words for the word um, miracle. That is uh, Simeon, 
I'm, pronoun I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. It's a Greek word that means miracle, and it means a sign, a mark, a token, or a wonder. Miracles and wonders by which God authenticates the men sent by him or by which men prove that the cause they are pleading is God's cause. Miracles and wonders as signs of divine authority. That's what the Strong's Concordance says about the word miracle in the New Testament, the word simeon. It's a mark or a token or a wonder. Miracles and wonders by which God's, God authenticates the men sent by him or by which men prove that the cause they are pleading is God's cause. The other, uh, and actually I, I looked up the, the word miracle also in the Webster's Dictionary, and Webster's Dictionary um, defines miracle, the word miracle, as an extraordinary, unusual, or outstanding event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs and taken as a sign of the supernatural power of God. Once again, a miracle defined by Webster's Dictionary is an extraordinary, unusual, or outstanding event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs and taken as a sign of the supernatural power of God. Because once again, I'm saying that a miracle is only something that God can do. We cannot perform miracles of our own accord, our own ability, our own power. But you have to have power to produce miracles. And so the premise of all of this right here today is this. Is that we all are going through things in this life. Especially right now. As we're getting closer and closer to the end of days, the end of time, the fulfillment of our redemption, the redemption of our souls. As we get closer and closer, as we inch forward every day with every breath, we get closer to the end. The last days, God's spirit is being poured out upon all of us and upon all flesh, the Bible says. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And upon my handmaidens and upon my servants will I pour out my spirit, saith the Lord. And that's also found in Joel 2 and also Acts 2, the fulfillment of that. Uh, which I digress, uh, in Exodus, where I, and I found this uh, study pre pretty interesting. In Exodus, when, uh, when the Spirit gets poured out upon the 70 that are appointed by Moses, and then there are other ones who start prophesying and start working among them. So some, some of the 70, they come and they, they start griping to Moses and saying, Hey, these guys here that you didn't appoint that I didn't see them standing in the line or around in the circle around you. They're, they're prophesying and they're doing all these th different things. And so Moses' response says, are you envious? Are you angry for my sake? I wish that all God's people were prophets and that his spirit would be upon all of them. That's what Moses' heart. The heart of a servant, the meekness of his heart was, God, I wish that you would pour out your spirit upon every one of them and that everybody here was a prophet. I think a little bit might be a little bit selfish because if God's spirit is governing the people, then you don't have to govern the people. The spirit is going to be governing them. So then everything that you're dealing with are the weightier matters and not the little things. So... I found that very interesting in doing it in a, in a study on the, uh, I believe it's the expanded version, the expanded Bible version. That's where I found it. So it, it went from there. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh, right? It links it to Moses' experience. I wish that all God's people were prophets. Goes to Joel 2. On the last day, said the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And it fulfills in Acts 2 where the Holy Ghost is being poured out and people are speaking in tongues and people are doing wonderful works and all of this stuff's happening. And that is the fulfillment of what happened in Exodus. I wish that all God's people were prophets and that God's spirit would be upon them. The prayer, the wish that Moses had back in Exodus was fulfilled in Acts 2. 
But that's not part of the lesson. That's just a little, <laughs> a little tangent I went on there. I apologize. So basically, right now, the thing that I believe we are all fighting the most is fighting this sense of fear. And I say that by saying that we are dealing with things now that we have not been dealing with before. We have, like I said on the last, on, on the last, uh, last week's uh, message, uh, we're walking through a place that we've never walked through before. Trying to recuperate, coming back from a pandemic that lasted three years or so. Our economy is not at where it should be. There's talks of recession. All of these different things are happening. And so we're walking through an uncharted area. We're walking through uncharted waters. We're walking through things that we have never walked through before. And this is why we need to follow the leading of the Spirit. Not only every Sunday, every Wednesday, every midweek service, every Saturday. No, it has to be a, a day-to-day Thing, a moment by moment, an hour by hour, a breath by breath, sort of aligning ourselves with the Spirit of God and with what He wants to do. So then now, we're dealing with problems, and the problems have these loud voices. Trouble seems to be on every side, is what uh, I believe is 2 Corinthians, where Paul says, we are troubled on every side. We are crushed by the pressure of these things. We're knocked down, but we are not out. We may be pressed on every side, but we are still standing, not by our own power, not by our own might, but only by the Spirit of the Lord can we stand one more day. The reliance or the dependence on His Spirit. This is why we're walking in uncharted territories. Because we don't know which way to go. We have to rely on the voice of the Lord guiding us and leading us every step of the way. On, I believe it's in uh, Exodus 14. Pastor Manzano shared this, uh, this, um, this message when I first got to uh, Russian Wind. Oh my God, maybe about five, five six years ago. And it really stuck out to me. It was, I believe it's in Exodus chapter 14, where he says that the Lord led the people of God as by with the harness. And he was leading them with the harness. So if you imagine an apparatus you put around yourself and it has a tethered line. And so he's leading them with an apparatus. You can only come wherever I lead you. You're coming this way. No, now you're coming this way. I am leading you with an apparatus in a harness. He was leading the people of God with a harness. And that, in my mind, is what the Holy Ghost does. He leads and guides us into all truth. He is leading us as with a harness. The Holy Ghost inside of us is literally the harness that leads us into all truth. In the direction that we should go, turn right, turn left, turn left, repent. <laughs> So that is what the leading of the Holy Ghost is and now in the believers. So I go back, right? The challenge is here's the problem that we are considering all of the problems, all of the trials, all of the troubles, all the tribulation, all of these things, the impossibilities that are coming against us. And we're trying to fix them on our own ability. We're trying to maintain and we're trying to move forward. We're trying to do what we can do on our own ability. But our own ability, based on this, we're facing things that are impossible. And the things that are impossible with men are not, pos are not impossible with God. The things that are impossible with me are not impossible with God. All things are possible. So now what needs to happen is I need to reach I need to reach for the power of the Holy Ghost because that is what's going to make the difference in every situation, in every outcome. I will have the victory because I have the victor living inside of me. And so what needs to happen is I need to let him speak. Ergo, the beginning of the scripture, talk of thy power. Talk of thy power. Because why? Because when people start hearing about the power of God to deliver, when we people start hearing about the power of God to save, to heal, to raise the dead, then that's their faith starts to grow. And there is a revival of growth, a revival of 
faith inside of the people. Why is that so important? Because the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, will he find faith on the earth? And another thing that's very important is because where their faith is, there is righteousness. God imputes righteousness where he sees faith. I have faith to believe and therefore I am counted righteous. And now the prayers of a righteous man avails much. If I come to God in my unbelief, if I have come to God in my doubts, then I am not considered righteous. So therefore I need to have faith. And this is why it's so important to have that personal communication, that personal prayer time with Jesus, because that's when the Bible says it's a rhema word, the rhema word. I'll tell you what, let me go back. Uh, it says, um, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's in Matthew, I want to say Matthew 4.4, 4, right? New Testament, right? That word there is uh, the word, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That word, word, is in the Greek, rhema. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. The connection here is in the Old Testament. Because in Deuteronomy, when God is testing the people of God, he gives them manna from heaven. And he says, you guys are going to gather once a day and twice as much on, on the Sabbath day to last you the following day. To test them and prove them whether they would be obedient. Now, this was not part of the message or the thought, but I'm just kind of going with the flow. So that word right there was the manna. And then he says, he proved them to teach them that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy, Matthew 4, 4. So the definition here in the Greek, that word is rhema. So he was literally feeding them rhema, the rhema word, the bread of life. Jesus was the bread of life and he speaks rhema words. He is the living Logos that speaks rhema words. The rhema words, why is that so important? Because the rhema word actually, the Bible says um, that hearing cometh by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word again is rhema. So faith comes into me and it increases the more I listen to the rhema word. The rhema word is the word that is being spoken in my ear when I go and pray. When I go and pray and seek God's face and I tell him all about my troubles, all about my problems, all about the things that are, that are ailing me, the impossibilities that are tormenting me, everything, repenting of my sins, confessing my faults and my failures, asking for forgiveness, that relationship there, then he speaks and he gives me words of encouragement, edification, comfort. And they are not only for me, but they're also for you. And that is what the beauty of all of this is. We become the oracles of God. We become the speaking voice of God that we start echoing what he says. I am no longer going to respond to the attacks of the enemy on my own ability, but I'm going to use the word just like Jesus did when he was attacked in the wilderness, tempted 40 days and 40 nights. What did he do? Did he speak his own word? No, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. By every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. It is written, thou shalt, tempt, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And him only shall you serve. You shall not serve any other gods. Right? So we have the written word. And we start memorizing that word to hide it in our hearts. The Bible talks about it in Psalms. It says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So when we stop meditating on the word, when we stop memorizing the word, when we stop declaring and confessing the word, that's when we start falling into these dark areas of temptation because it's black and white. But then somehow we start going into the little gray areas of life. We say, eh, it's not so bad. It's only a little thing. It's not a big deal. And the biggest lie we tell ourselves, I can handle it. I can handle it. This is not that bad. I can handle this. Now, if it was somebody else, a new saint, a new convert, somebody younger, that would be a problem. But uh, 
I can handle this. This is only a little thing. But that little thing starts growing and growing and growing and growing until it becomes a stronghold in our lives. So how do we do this? What we do is we need to confess the same thing that we did in the beginning, repenting of our sins, confessing. That is what we need to do every day to stay clean, to stay clear, and to be aligned with God's heart, God's face, God's spirit. So, like I said before, we're talking about the tormenting problems, the tormenting troubles. These things all have voices. The pressures, the creditors calling, sending you those final notices. The, the you know, you got the mortgage companies calling you. You got the, your cars getting, getting ready to get repossessed. All these things. The doctor's report, you're going to die next week. You know, oh, you got a terminal disease. Blah, 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 blah. We start taking all of these things and because we're seeing these documents on paper in black and white, we start taking these things as the letter of the law and as the ultimate final outcome. But man's words are not the final outcome. It's what God says that it actually matters and his is the final decision. So, like I said, we need to compare our problems to his power not to our own ability. It's the devil's trick to try to get us to do things on our own ability, on our own accord, and our own righteousness, right? So then that way he directs the fight toward us. And we, in ourselves, our flesh is too weak to be able to sustain that. But we always need to point to the cross as a source of our righteousness, as a source of our justification, as a source of our power and strength, not by might, not by man's power, but only by the Spirit of the Lord. And that's how we succeed. So the problems, just like David faced the giant, and that giant was voicing out, bring me a man that we might fight. Right? He took away the power of the army. An army against army. And he says, no, let's make this personal. Let's make it me against you. And that's what the devil does. He wants to try to make it him against you. Let's go. He knows he has more training, more time, more practice doing this. He's tried it on kings and succeeded in deceiving kings. He's tried it on prophets. He's tried it on powerful, noble men. And he succeeded. So he has this over sense of confidence that oh, I can take him on. I can take her on. I'll deceive him. So I'm going to make this personal. It's just you and me. We're going to go toe to toe. Let's go. But the Bible says that we are to be hid in Christ. That's where our safety is. To be hidden in Christ. And then when he appears, we shall appear with him also. We are to be hidden in Christ. We who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That means I have stepped into Christ. Like I put on a, like a, like a sweater or I put on a jacket. I'm baptized into my jacket. I put it on. I put on Christ. So now I'm inside of Christ, right? That's where the power is. Being inside of Christ and not coming out from the, he from the hiding place. Because he is my hiding place. Psalms 91, the hiding place is found in Christ. <laughs> That's revelation because I never actually thought about that before. But uh, that is a revelation there. Psalms 91, hidden in the shadow of the Almighty. In the shadow of the Almighty, in the secret place. Blessed is he who bides in the secret place of the Almighty. And the secret place is in Christ. We are baptized. We are hid in Christ. That is where our power and the stronghold abides. Our ability beyond ourselves is found in Christ. So the devil wants to try to trick you to get you out of Christ and to fight with him on your own ability, on your own accord, by your own strength, by your own will, by your own power. Because every time we do this, I prayed about it. But I'm, now I'm going to take matters into my own hands and I'm going to tell that person where to go. Every time we do that, we lose automatically. We already lost. Even if we thought we won, we lost. Because every time we take on the fight 
that God is fighting for us. He cannot fight for us if we are fighting the same battle, defending ourselves. He cannot defend us if we are defending ourselves. We have to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It doesn't say go and fight with these people. It's stand still. Don't respond to the accusations, but rather praise. Like in, uh, I believe it's 2 Chronicles 20, uh, where Jehoshaphat wins the fight, and he sends out those singers, he appoints the singers, and they start saying, Blessed be the Lord, for his love endureth forever. For his love endureth forever. As the worshipers and praisers started to sing, the Lord sent a blanket of confusion about the conspiracy and the multiple armies that were coming against them, and then they started killing each other. And the people didn't have to lift a finger. That is God's fighting tactics in operation. When we let go of the fight, when we let go of the trouble, when we say, God, it's up to you, whether you do something about it or not, it doesn't matter anymore. I give this problem with this person, this ill feeling, this thing that I'm thinking, these wrong actions, these hurtful things that happened to me, I give them to you, I offer them upon the altar Today, once and for all, and then we see the right hand of power come and defend us. So, like I said, we're talking about power because the problems has a power. The trouble has a power. These pressures of life have some power over us, and that's why they're affecting us so much. And so... What do we need? We need to stop taking these matters into our own hands and try to figure everything else out on our own. What we need to do is we need to implement the power of God. But how do we do that? Because we need somebody to talk of his power. We need somebody to declare the glory of his kingdom. We need somebody, and that could be you. But what are we going to say about this? Well, let me give you an example. I started doing a little study on there on, about the power of God. Uh, and it talks about the miracles. Uh, Strong's Concordance again, you know. Uh, it, it says uh, the miracles of the Old Testament. And it starts, I'll give you just a couple of them because I, I know the time is short. Uh, examples of the Old Testament miracles. The first one that comes up is creation. Creation itself. The fact that you and I are here spinning around at whatever speed the earth spins around, around the sun every year. He hangs the earth on nothingness. And so the power of creation, how did he create? He spoke it into existence. That is power to be able to just speak something and boom, it happens. Let there be light and light appeared. Let there be the heavens and the earth and boom, it all appeared. That is power. So now we're comparing our problem to his power. Not my own ability anymore, but to his power. Then Enoch's translation. This man is walking with God and then boom, he's not. He was translated into heaven. He never even saw death. That is power. So now you're the God that you're serving has this type of power. And we're worrying about this little trouble, this little problem that I can't fix on my own. You see how it's unbalanced? But we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're magnifying the problem instead of speaking to the trouble, instead of prophesying to the problem. Because that's what David did. He said, this day, I'm going to cut your head off. And feed your head to the fowls. And he never even had a sword. All he had was a slingshot and a, and a staff. That's it. He didn't even have a sword. He said, today I'm going to cut your head off and feed you to the fowls. And then that's what he ended up doing. With the devil or with the enemy's own sword. So that tactic is what the devil tries to use on us. The Bible says that by your words are you justified and by your words are you condemned. So when we start speaking negatively, we are literally cutting off our own throat. When we start speaking positively, then we're speaking life. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. God has given us that ability. The power of the tongue. So now you can dig your own grave by the negative things that you're saying, woe is me, everything's against me, oh my God, I'm never going to get out of this mess, oh Lord, why have you forsaken me, and all of these crazy thoughts, I say crazy, because the confessions of a sound mind are not crazy. 
Bible says that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. What's a sound mind? A sound mind actually means a saved mind. Because only crazy talk crazy. Only crazy talk crazy. So if I'm going to be start voicing out my voice and start proclaiming things, why am I saying all of these negative things? And it's literally an insult to God. God, this problem is so big. It is too big for you to even fix. But the Bible says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is his arm so short that he cannot save, that he cannot deliver? He is a healer. He is the one that created all things out of nothingness. And you're going to say, you don't have the power. This problem is way too big. I have fallen down so far, too far for your hand to reach. I've gone into the darkness so far that you are light, cannot even find me. That is what we're literally saying by our actions and by our words. But we're comparing the problem to ourselves. We're we're comparing our struggles to our own ability. We're comparing the addiction, the, the struggle with these things, the temptations to ourselves. But we need to, we compare the problem to his power. Does he have enough power to save? Does he have enough power to deliver? Does he have enough power to heal? Does he have enough power to raise the dead? Does he have enough power to forgive every single sin? Does he have enough power to outlast time itself? The answer is yes, 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 yes. He has enough power because we serve an unlimited, all-powerful, all-knowing God. He is not limited by time or space like we are. He is the unlimited God who is able to do all things. There, The things that are impossible with me and you are not impossible with him. So like I said, giving the examples of the Old Testament, miracles, because there are miracles, you have to have power to perform miracles, right? So the flood, Tower of Babel, The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. All of these were supernatural acts. Miracles, right? Miracles. God demonstrating, displaying his power upon the earth. Only something that only God can do. That is the definition of a miracle. Something that only God can do. So, Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt in an instant. The burning bush where God starts speaking to Moses. Moses' rod, the turning into a serpent and taking it back up. Moses' hand, turning leprous and then turning back healthy again. The ten plagues. That one got me. That one got me. The ten plagues, right? Because we start seeing the destruction that happened. The plague of the lice, the plague of the frogs, the the, the plague of darkness. Even the plague of death over the firstborn at the end. All of these things seem to be negative. Because we're saying, oh my God, these are plagues, the pestilences, the sicknesses, all these things. Oh my God, these must be bad because they're negative. But these were actually miracles. God displaying his miracle. I believe it's in Romans 10 where he talks about Pharaoh. And he says, well, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And upon whom I harden, I will, I will harden. And he says, for this cause, I think it's Romans 9, For this cause have I raised you up, Pharaoh, that I might display my power. So he used Pharaoh's stiff-neckedness, Pharaoh's hardened heart to show God's power upon Egypt. What for? To make his name known and create fame. The God of Israel is the one true living God. The God of Israel has the power to deliver. At that moment in Egypt, They were the strongest army, the mightiest army of the world. So here's a group of people who are slaves and don't even know how to fight. And they start praying and they start following God. And all of a sudden, God starts bringing down the thunder upon the people until they let them go. The parting of the Red Sea. Remember now, we're comparing your problem, whatever that may be, with God's power. Does he have enough power to deliver? Does he have enough power to save you? Does he have enough power to heal you? Does he have enough power to raise you from the dead? The Bible says yes. Unequivocally, yes. 
Yes, yes. So then we move forward, right? The 10 plagues. Then we start talking about the prophets. And these are only just a, 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 a couple of them, not all of them. I'll probably end up doing a study on all of them and maybe posting them online. You know, the, the Bible verse on the power of God, right? And um, so the prophets calling down fire from heaven. The prophets healing the sick, throwing himself over a little boy to raise him again back from the dead. Calling the drought, speaking unto the elements and saying, sun and moon stand still. Speaking unto the elements and saying, no more rain until I pray again. That is going from power, from power to power and glory to glory. Because we're, they're speaking what God has given them to speak. That is what makes everything so powerful. My words of themselves are not powerful at all. But, they're, but where the word of a king is, there is what? Power. For the word of the king. Because that means it has authority. There is something behind it. If the king says, off with your head, you're as good as dead. If the king says, I have favor upon you, everybody loves you. Right? Because the word of the king, where the word of the king is, there is power. There is authority. There's something behind that word. And so who is the king of kings? The Lord of glory. He is the king of kings. And when he says, you will be healed, you will be raised from the dead, this terminal disease is not going to terminate you, but you're going to rise up again. I am allowing these things to happen to bring about a, a, an audience. This might be the purpose of the trial and why God has not actually healed you yet. It's because he's bringing an audience. He's bringing an audience. He's waiting to see what's going on here and bringing a bunch of people. I'll call them the looky loose. See what's going on here. Oh, see, they've been praying about this thing and they've been fasting about this thing. They've been pouring, pouring oil upon that person for years now. But one day, after enough people have been gathered, God will bring and perform the miracle in front of all of the unbelievers that they might see the power of God to deliver, to heal, to raise the dead from the deathbed. I'm just crazy enough to believe this. Now, I said we're talking about miracles, we're talking about the power of God. And the reason why they're too connected is found in, in the, the other definition that I'm going to say right now, uh, doing the word miracle. Right? Defining the word miracle, which I already did a lot of the words miracle. Then the last one I'm going to do is the word dynamis. Dynamis. You guys probably have heard this word before, dynamis, which it basically means is where we get the word dynamite. And it's very used, often used uh, in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, and also in, uh, in Luke. Luke 24 says, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That word is dynamis. Consequently, it's actually the same word as miracle. It's the same word as miracle. We're talking about the miracle working power of God. Right? The word dynamis in the Greek means miracle as well as power. And it means strength, power, or ability. Inherent and residing power in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or a thing exerts and puts forth. Moral power of excellence of soul. The power and influence which belongs to riches and wealth. Power and resource, resources arising from numbers. They say there's strength in numbers, right? There's power in multiple people coming together. And here's the last one. Power for performing miracles. Power for performing miracles. Power for performing miracles. Right? So then, going to the New Testament, we see Jesus. His birth, virgin birth, that was a miracle in itself. 
Turning the water into wine, another miracle. Delivering a demon-possessed man and multiple people multiple times. Healing the blind, blind Blaramidus, whatever his name is. <laughs> healing the blind, healing the lady with the issue of blood, healing the leper, the paraplegic, paraplegic. restoring a man with a withered hand inside of a synagogue, and raising the dead. His friend Lazarus, one of them. And now Jesus has also promised that greater these works, these exact words, and greater than these works shall you do if you believe. So then the question is, do you believe? I believe all things are possible. So the things that come against me, I gives me something to speak back. The Bible talks about it in Romans 8, where it says, What shall we say to these things? These impossibilities, these troubles, these trials, these persecutions, these problems. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That gives us something to say. God is for me. And because God is for me, I can come against this thing, this combatant thing, this distressful thing, and it will be under my feet. I can take dominion over all the power of the enemy because Jesus has given us that authority and you will have power over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. So that gives us something to talk back to our trouble. We have the word of the Lord. We have the promise to profess, we have the word of promise to proclaim. And so we can prophesy to our problems. We don't have to just sit there and be tormented. Because as long as we keep our mouths shut, then the enemy can just bombard our minds with all of his thoughts of defeat. But the word of the Lord and the Lord, of the, the Lord God Almighty that resides in us, he's not there condemning us. He is our justifier. He is not condemning us. Those are the words of the enemy. Condemning you, trying to hold you down, trying to hold you back, trying to keep you quiet because you need to speak to the enemy in the gate. The gate is here and the enemy is here. Most of us may not want to deal with that, but the enemy is at our gate. And so now it is time for our sons and daughters to rise up and speak with the enemy in the gate. This is why the Spirit of the Lord is pouring out the Spirit upon all flesh and raising up sons and daughters to prophesy because that gives them the word to speak at that moment, at that time. You don't have to premeditate what you're going to say for it will be given to you what you shall speak. And the words that you speak, the gainsayers are not going to be able to gainsay nor resist because you're speaking with wisdom that is beyond your own. It's not man's wisdom. It's not earthly wisdom, but it's a heavenly wisdom that you're speaking through and you become an oracle and you become a conduit and you allow God to speak through you. And that, that when you allow God to speak, the word of the king is going forth with power. That's why you can speak unto that death spirit. And say, today I take power and dominion over you, death spirit. You shall not have my loved one. We call and confess deliverance today. And we call upon the angels of the Lord to come and bring forth ministry. And to minister unto those to restore them back into health. We saw this in Hebrews 11. It says, and the women who had their sons being raised back again from the dead. God has happened. It's happened before. Why not now? Because greater works than these shall you do if you believe. I believe I'm talking to people right now who are people of faith. I believe that I'm talking to people in the future when they log in later on who are people of faith. And that faith is enough. That is all that you need. I believe and therefore I speak. I believe that is the spirit of faith and that is the word of faith. The word that I speak are the words that he gives. And now we have something to speak against the devil, to speak and take dominion over those tormenting things that have come against us day after day, night after night, all of these things that have come against us. We are rising up today because today is the day of deliverance. Today is your day of victory. Today is your day to be healed. Today is your day to be raised up from the spiritual deathbed that you allowed yourself to get to because you allowed all of these thoughts to bombard you and to make you believe 
that God doesn't love you, to make you believe that everyone's against you, to make you believe that you're good, that you're good is not good enough. But I'm here to tell you today that your good is good enough because God makes up the difference. The Bible says when we fall short, when we sin, we fall short of his glory. But grace makes up the difference between where we should be and where we actually are. This distance here is what God makes up the difference. Grace makes up that difference. Grace fills in the gap. And it makes up the difference of intercession. When we don't know how to pray, because we get so emotionally overwhelmed by these trials, by the longevity of this trial, it just seems like, my God, I don't even see the end of the tunnel here. I don't even see a light. All I see is darkness. And God, how long am I going to go through this same trial? Year after year after year after year. You get to a point where you become frustrated and you get tired and weary in the wilderness. But this is today is when we are calling upon the angels that ministered unto the Lord Jesus after his 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says that the angels came and ministered unto him, restoring him, giving him strength. So right now I'm calling upon the angels for you in intercessory prayer for you. You who are listening right now, you who are watching, and you who are watching the future, I'm praying for you right now that the Lord bring an angelic host to come to your home or where you are right now in intercessory prayer that they may lift up your hands because your hands are weak. Strengthen your your knees because they're getting knobby and they're getting wobbly. But God sees where you are right now and you are not forsaken. You are not a lost cause and you are not left to die in the desert of loneliness. The Lord knows exactly who you are and where you are and right now he is dispatching an angelic host to come and give you the grace that you need you don't have to walk around browbeating yourself condemning yourself for every fault every failure you can abide in confidence that you are justified you are made righteous not because of anything that you did but because what Jesus did on the cross once and for all that's the source of my justification I mess up in my flesh every day, but it's not based on my own ability, my own power, my own steam, but it's based on the blood streams that flows down from Calvary's tree. That same blood that forgives my sins is the same blood that gives the power to heal my worst sickness, to raise me from the dead, to bring peace to my mind when I'm tormented. Because of his stripes, I am healed. Although my body may still feel the symptoms, but my declaration of faith is regardless of how my body feels, I believe I'm healed. Because I was healed over 2,000 years ago. By his stripes, I am healed. And so regardless of what the doctors say, what my body tries to give me as symptoms, I am healed by the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of our God as he sanctifies us within to the out. So, like I said, once again, in, in, in closing, let us stop comparing our problems to ourselves, but let us compare our multiple problems to his power. And we'll see that his power is greater than all our problems. And the revelation in here is, is that greater is he that is in you and me than he that is in the world. We have that power, that creative power by the Spirit of God. We can speak things into existence. We have the power to create. We have the power to kill or to make alive because of the power of the tongue. Speak life or you speak death. What are you speaking over your situation? Are you speaking death over it, negative things? Or are you speaking positive words of faith, affirmation of life? The difference between light and darkness in the beginning, in chapter 1 of Genesis, it was dark, chaotic, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the difference between the light and the darkness 
is what God said. And that same ability, that same power, that same miracle working power, he has given to you when you repented of your sins, when you were baptized in the name of Jesus, when he filled you with the Holy Ghost, you have that same power. All it needs to do is just be activated inside of you. And I hope that these words that I'm sharing with you guys today and the ones that I've shared throughout these other devotionals are encouraging you, are helping you, are enlightening you with who you are in Christ Jesus. Living up to your fullest potential. You don't have to be a beggar begging for crumbs. But we are the rightful heirs of the commonwealth of Israel. And we have the right to eat the whole loaf of deliverance because the children's bread was healing. And I end with this. I believe it's in Matthew 15 where Jesus comes and uh, the lady from uh, the Sinophoenician woman comes and uh, she's not a Jewish person. So Jesus was sent forth to the Jews. And so she says, God, Jesus starts to saying, you know, my daughter's sick with this sickness and all this other stuff. She's back home. And he's like, I'm not even going to listen to you. I'm just going to walk and keep on doing. And so she starts getting more and more desperate because she's heard. Because she heard about Jesus. And this is what is connecting it to Psalms 145. Because then... They will, uh, all thy works shall praise thee, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. So what happens? When Jesus starts healing people, that was getting noised abroad. Everybody, here, here comes Jesus. Did you hear about him? He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's forgiving sins. This guy can do everything. Oh, my God. And so the lame, the people who are blind, the people with issues of blood, that same lady, she heard that Jesus was coming. The lady with the issue of blood, she heard Jesus is coming. And that's what gave her the hope. If I can just get to him and touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be healed. Same thing with blind, with a blind beggar. They said, Jesus is coming. I heard of Jesus, even though I can't see a thing. I'm living in darkness right now. But I heard that the healer is coming. And so I need healing for my eyes. I need healing for my spiritual eyes. I know I live in darkness right now and everywhere I turn, I can't see the light. I'm tired of living this way and begging my way through life. And then I hear that Jesus is coming. And so, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And then they say, be quiet, be quiet. Keep your peace, be quiet. You're disturbing the master. And at that point, I'm a beggar, so I would probably end up saying, yeah, you're right, I'll be quiet. I don't have a position to say. I don't have a right to call on his name. But my desperation, because I am blind, and I want to be healed, so I'm going to scream louder and louder, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they said, hey, take it easy. Be of good comfort. Jesus has stopped and he said, go get him. His cries are touching my heart. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but that's what it, what it, what it implies. The cries of a desperate man who needed a touch from God, touched the heart of God. And he says, get that guy and bring him here. There's going to be a miracle that's going to happen today. Because this man is desperate enough to do whatever I tell him. The same thing with the Sinophoenician woman. He says, I, I didn't come to see about the, about the, uh, I came to see about the children of Israel. I didn't come to see about you. I didn't come to hear about the dogs. That's what they called the Gentiles before. They called them dogs. And so then she could have gotten offended. That. The Lord called her a dog or a little puppy. He said, I didn't come to see about you. I came to see about the children of Israel. You're a Gentile. It's not your time. And she could have gotten offended. and She would have walked away and gone home. But she pressed past her pride. 
she pressed past her pride because she said, I need deliverance. I need healing for my daughter. It's not even for me. My heart aches because my children are hurting and I can't do anything about it. So I, whatever you call me, you call me a dog, I'm going to say bow, wow, wow. Bow, wow, wow. I don't care. And so she started to worship. And I saw that as soon as she started to worship, the Lord turns around and she says, yes, Lord, this is true. But even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. I don't have to eat the whole loaf. I just need a little crumb. I just need a little crumb. I believe that that little crumb of a word is going to give me the healing that I need for my daughter. Because that's what I'm doing right now. I'm interceding for my daughter, for my son, for my loved one. And that little word, that word right there, all I need you to say is just be healed. That's all I need. And not my faith. I believe this. And so, that stopped Jesus. There's only two times that Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus marveled. It's like, whoa. Whoa, this is what blew my mind. Only two times in the Bible that says that Jesus marveled. One was when he said to that lady, I am seeing such great faith in all of Israel. This lady, she just believes me. Even though I called her a dog and insulted her, she says, you know what? Bow, wow, wow. I just need a little crumb. I just need a little word. And that'll be enough to get the healing that I need for my daughter. This lady will take me at my word. That made the Lord marvel. And the other version of that, or not the other version, but the other instance in where the Lord marvels is when he sees that people don't believe. And he marveled at their unbelief. You must not know who I am. Nothing is impossible for me and you don't believe that I can do this miracle? That's the second time that he marveled. What? 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 So one is a good marvel because he said, this lady, she'll take me at my word. It doesn't matter what I tell her. It doesn't matter how much I insult her. She's still coming back. The persistence of faith, the persistence of prayer, the persistence of faith. I don't care what I need to press through. I'm going to need, I need to get what I need to get today. Today, I'm tired. I don't have to live with the frogs one more night. I can have what deliverance that I need today. And so can you. So like I said, let us compare, stop comparing the problems to ourselves and our own ability or our friends, our loved ones, resources to help. But let us start comparing our problem to his power. Does he have enough power to overpower our problem? The answer is yes. And he lives inside of you, inside of me. And we have to activate that voice. Just echoing and voicing out what he says. And that is where we will find our strength, our power, our ability, because we believe. So with that, I leave you today. Thank you again for bearing with me. God bless you guys. I'll see you guys, Lord willing, next Saturday.